Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bridget Maloney, and I'm the Managing Director of the University of Waterloo's Corporate Engagement Office called JEDI, and it stands for a Gateway for Enterprises to Discover Innovation. First, we at the University of Waterloo want to acknowledge we live and work on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. The University of Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to the six nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Our active work toward reconciliation takes place across our campuses <clears throat> through research, learning, teaching, and community building, and it's centralized within our Office of Indigenous Relations. So I'm very pleased you could join us for this month's 30 Minutes with the Jedi Exchange webinar. These webinars are part of the Jedi Exchange's mission to support the success of startups and scale-ups affiliated with the University of Waterloo, regardless of where the company is located uh, globally. And it actively promotes collaboration amongst its members, uh, which are both small and large companies and the university itself. So for today, we'll be focusing on the theme, women's pelvic floor disorders. Half of all women will suffer from them, but little is said about this silent epidemic how breakthroughs in technology are making a difference. Given International Women's Day is held uh, in March each year, we thought this topic is especially well-suited to cover in this month's webinar. So I'd like to welcome Rachel Bartholomew from High Ivy and A. Nian San from Cosm Medical as our guests who will talk uh, about this topic after they introduce themselves. The panelist portion will be 30 minutes in length, uh, followed by an optional 10 minute Q&A, and we're hope you're able, we hope you're able to stay with us for that. Um, throughout the webinar, please feel free to send any questions you have via the Zoom Q&A. You just click Q&A in the bottom center of your Zoom window. I wanted to let you know this event is being recorded and will be uploaded to Jedi's YouTube channel. So now I'd like to turn it over to our guests. Uh, let's start with A to introduce yourself and Cosa Medical, and then over to Rachel to introduce herself and Hi Ivy. Hi, good afternoon. My name is A. I am CTO of Cosa Medical. Uh, Cosa Medical was founded by Derek Sham, our CEO, um, that, who founded uh, Cosm in 2017 after watching his grandmother suffer from pelvic organ prolapse. We're a personalized pelvic health company, and um, we our first device that we are building is gynothotics. Um, gynothotics um, is to help with pelvic organ prolapse. It happens when the pelvic muscles are weak and your internal organs, such as the bladder, the rectum, and the uterus, actually fall through, fall uh, out of the vagina. And that's associated with a lot of pain, can lead to urinary and fecal incontinence. One of the treatments of pelvic organ prolapse is to wear something called a pestry. These are devices that have been in existence for over 50 years. However, um, the current issue with that is we have so many different sizes and so many different shapes. So it's very challenging for the clinician and the patient to work together. It's a lengthy process. Um, so some patients never find the correct fit. And even if patients do wear it, there is a high dropout rate, about 30% of people drop out from wearing pessaries after six months. So we want to fix that. And then so the, the subsequent to that, they end up getting surgery that also leads to complications. Um, so what here at COSM we are doing is um, providing more um, technology, innovation and new proprietary technology to size the vagina, to measure it accurately so that we can provide specific pestry for each and individual woman. So, you know, our vaginas are not circular, um, an oval shape and in different angles, different support. So that's what we're working on at COSM. Thanks, A. I, I look forward to learning more about that. So Rachel, could you please introduce yourself and hi, Ivy. Of course, of course. So my name is Rachel Bartholomew. I'm the CEO and founder of Hi Ivy Health. Uh, 
very similar story. So uh, I created high IV out of my own cervical cancer diagnosis that I've been kind of fighting over the last two years. Um, and in the process of going through my treatments, I realized that Similarly, I always say Cosm and I are in a competition on who has the older technology. I think Cosm beats us by 20 years, but we're about an 83 year old technology with these uh, static dilators that we are innovating on. Um, so essentially these are like these uh, Russian dolls that are supposed to help stretch uh, the muscles and break down scar tissue after things like menopausal atrophy, all the way to cancer radiation treatments and endometriosis. So um, we have created a pelvic wand uh, that conducts three different therapies. So we do self-lubrication, hot and cold, and autodilation. And we track a number of um, data points from sensors in that device. And that's sent to a patient mobile app. And then that's all paired up with some subjective data and then sent to their active clinician. And so we work directly with OBGYNs and pelvic floor physiotherapists to do remote patient monitoring of the pelvic floor. Really interesting, Rachel, and thank you both of you for sharing the story behind why you you got involved or and or launched your companies. Really appreciate that. So I'll start with some questions. So with women's pelvic floor health being discussed so little, can can and you've kind of you've done this already, but uh, a great job. But can you kind of catch us up on what the term means? Um, typical problems and what therapy and devices are commonly used. So I know you've kind of covered that, but yeah. is there anything else you'd like to add at all? Maybe Rachel over to you. Yeah. So to kind of give a, a breakdown of it, um, when we go through all the way from, you know, pre-menstruation all the way to post-menopause, women's pelvic floor I would say goes through a little bit of hell and back. <laughs> and, you know, there's all sorts of life changes that cause all of these different things to occur. Um, the science is only catching up now in terms of defining the difference between what's called hypertonic and hypotonic. And these things are very separate and different. And Cosm and I actually live in both of these worlds where, you know, hypotonic, think of it as, um, you're giving birth, you're, you're losing estrogen and you're losing that density and you're losing that kind of elasticity in the muscles and in the, in the surrounding tissues. And so things like prolapse will happen. Um, you've overstretched the muscles and maybe damaged them from having a baby. Uh, and so that leads to this hypotonic. And this often is where you need the support, like the pessaries, you need things like Kegel exercisers and electrostimulators to help tighten those muscles. You need a workout for those muscles. Subsequently on the hypertonic side, um, think of this as dense, tight tissues, muscles, no elasticity, a lot of like denseness. This is where we live. Um, and this is essentially where you wouldn't go to the gym to work out like a knot or a muscle knot in your shoulder, you go and get a massage. And it's kind of the same sort of concept where you want to relax and you want to pull out the muscles and pull out that tissue and make it more elastic. Uh, and these terms only just started. And so my biggest thing with pelvic floor health is if there is an issue, you experience pain, you experience something, you most likely have some sort of pelvic floor issue that you need to get addressed. It's not normal. It's not natural. And only now are women starting to realize that. I don't actually have to deal with this pain and there can actually be something that I can do about this. Oh. And the introduction of physiotherapy has really, really helped with this as well, but I'll let I kind of uh, add some more to this. Thank you. Yes. Yes. I, hey. Oh, you're on mute. Go. Yes. So, um, starting from when we were young, I think things are getting better to address, um, you know, to follow up on what Rachel said, like when um, I was pregnant about nine years ago, nobody really talked about pelvic muscle exercises. I went to the prenatal classes, uh, but I know my one of my best friends actually just now had a, had a baby and now it's starting to be, uh, there's more awareness, they're talking about it. Um, so I, it's, I think, um, you know, the, the society is moving towards the right direction. And I hope companies like High IV and Cosm will propel that forward. Great. That's terrific. So 
both High Ivy and Cosm Medical, you apply 21st century technologies to creating new solutions. So additive manufacturing, IoT, material science, data science, AI. Can you describe what you're doing in, in that realm? A, over to you first. Sure, yes. Our technology is, I'm a system design by background. So this is a perfect role for me where everything is coming together. You know, I think there's there are minimally four main streams um, and technology streams that Cosm is innovating on. The first is our hardware. Um, and we're using ultrasound system, of course, but when you ultrasound the vagina in its natural state, it's collapsed. You can't see anything, you can't size it. So we are developing proprietary uh, consumables and devices to, um, to shape it properly so that under ultrasound, we get a clear view, a 3D view. And more importantly, we're also measuring the pressure and the changes that happens um, during the dynamic movements as you do contraction of Valsava where the prolapse is uh, most uh, visual, uh, visualized. So, um, you know, so then we have all this data now, what do we do with that? So we are developing AI, we're using AI ML technologies um, then to extract, um, I mean, uh, to extract data, a lot of data from these images and analyzing them with our prediction algorithms so that um, we can say, you know, we can recommend um, what pest size and shapes and dimensions will be most suitable. And then together with that, of course, now we get into um, personal or customized manufacturing, um, made to order manufacturing, which is a challenging problem in its own because you cannot make tens of thousands of devices ready to be shipped from an Amazon warehouse. So we are using 3D printing. Um, thankfully, these days there's a lot of innovation happening in that space. In particular, of course, they have to be biocompatible um, and pestries are worn for a longer period of time. So there's a lot of burden on safety and efficacy with our devices. Um, and right. so we're, yeah, we're working with, uh, we're taking the, you know, learnings from other industries such as dental, custom dental molds, um, the hearing aid industry, orthotic industry, and using those best practices um, and deploying them and and uh, yes, so we hope right. to, we hope to have our product um, fully tested in the next year. Oh, that's wonderful. And then Rachel, what about high Ivy and all the the various kind of elements of technology that come together? Yeah, so I mean, we're innovating on something that has, I mean, it's a piece of plastic on a stick, right? So, you know, any sort of additional technology that can help the, the ease of use to, you know, the comfort levels to that feasibility. Um, I think our biggest strength is on the you know, remote patient monitoring side, keeping women at home, keeping, um, you know, pelvic floor therapy, something that all women can get, uh, even outside of the office is our biggest biggest challenge. And part of that is really understanding how you're conducting your, your pelvic floor therapy on yourself, if you're doing it correctly, uh, as well as what your body's response is. And a lot of the times women just don't understand these things because, you know, we're just not taught and we're just not aware of, of you know, what our bodies are going through. So part of it is being able to conduct a therapy that can never replace a therapist, but at least is a step in the right direction. Um, be able to track what that therapy is doing and how the body's responding to it. Pair that with, how are you feeling mentally, physically? You know, what's your pain like today? What are some of the bodily things that you're going through today um, in a comfortable setting that's under your control? And then allowing the doctor to then use that data to, you know, change your recommendations, change your protocol, um, and make sure that you don't have to always come into the office and have a, a therapy session happening. So part of that is, is a big data play, and we'll, we'll talk about data, I'm sure, down the, down the road in the questions, but, um, you know, looking at the data and understanding how do we bring concepts of 
you know, respiratory health, heart health, all these things we do remote patient monitoring for anyways, uh, to some of these more specific areas on, you know, pelvic health or women's health in general. Right, right. That makes a lot of sense. It's so interesting. So actually, I'll segue Rachel right into the next question with you. So you, you pointed this out, you touched on this, that there, there seem to be three domains involved in making progress with better treatment options. They're sociological, biological, technological, um, and is that a fair assessment? And then second part to that question is, what's been either the biggest obstacle or what offers the biggest potential um, for your companies when we talk about you know, the technology, the biology, the social factors. So maybe Rachel, if you'd like to comment on that and then A over to you after. Most definitely. So there's a lot of obstacles. I know A and myself are going through this and I think part of it is taking this medical device first approach, going through proper clinical evidence, which I know AA's company, they've just finished theirs and, and there's many more to come, right? I think part of what we're seeing in this industry is a lot of uh, companies who unfortunately leverage the, the lack of FDA oversight in this area because it can be categorized under sexual wellness. Uh, and so we have a lot of products that go direct to consumer. Um, they, prove, they, they say, you know, 15, 15 days and you have improvements and results. And maybe that's correct, but assuming that you do something, you get a quick fix is, is not a thing in this industry and in, in pelvic health. And I think starting to change that narrative comes down to the way that we've taught gynecological and pelvic health. It comes down to the way that we, you know, treat women and, and help women. I think part of it has to do with old school versus new school mentality and science as well. Um, but then we have a layer of stigma layered into all of this. You know, I, I, I like to share I chatted with an insurance company that we all know in Canada, and they said, well, women have to ask for these types of products to, from their employer. And I'm like, how are, how are women going to walk into an office and ask for a device from their, for their vagina uh, to their employer comfortably? And there's these layers of things of women not wanting to talk about it, feeling ashamed or embarrassed all the way to not being heard from their doctors. And those layers of those societal things that come into play here on top of being told it's normal to be told that, oh, just drink some wine or just relax and you'll be fine. That layers into this whole lack of technology and innovation, thinking it's niche um, is another big thing. This is not niche. I mean, one in three women, I don't believe is niche, but I mean, somebody else can prove me wrong. Um, and those, all those things layer into this lack of research, lack of evidence, lack of, you know, pulling up our socks and getting the proper medical backing on all of these things. And so I think there's a lot of problems layered into this, but if we start to take the right approaches to gather evidence, to change the medical system, to change the way we approach it and make women feel more comfortable, I think we're in the right, right direction or thanks. heading there. Yes. Thanks, Rachel. And then a, so um, on, on that topic, maybe, maybe you could discuss, <clears throat> excuse me, there's obstacles, but also potential as well, right? Yes, and where do you see potential for your company? <clears throat> the, you know, we've been doing a lot of clinician interviews with our clinician user groups, our patient user groups, and the one synonymous thing that um, everybody wants is a solid knowledge base and education, um, you know, rely from reliable sources. So that's what we will be addressing as part of our digital health app. app. Um, you know, one, we're making one on the clinician side. I think High IV is doing a similar approach, an app for the clinicians, an app for the patients, um, so that we can all be connected with the, the right knowledge and um, have our, you know, health in our hands. Right, right. And you touched on um, when you talked about, you know, a knowledge base and, and so on. And, and Rachel touched on this in her previous um, comment, but there does seem to be, you know, for the most part, seems these days, like we don't have trouble talking about childbirth issues, prostate cancer, breast cancer, but there still seems to be a stigma associated 
with sort of progressing the conversation and the technology associated with women's pelvic uh, floor health. Do you, do you see that, A, and are you, um, would you like to comment on that as well? Yes, definitely. I think, you know, even myself, I didn't know about prolapse actually until I read the job description of COSM. So I just don't think there's enough awareness there. And as Rachel mentioned, we get kind of pumped into, you know, sexual um, devices, sexual um, category, and then people don't openly want to talk about it. So just like 24 years ago when Viagra was approved by the FDA, you know, companies, pharmaceutical companies spend a lot of money on advertising awareness. Um, and so, you know, this is where I think the women's pelvic floor market needs to be. Um, and, and, and we hope to get there in the next five, 10 years. Right. Okay. Thank you. So switching a little bit over to, um, so, so the data element. So both of your companies, a, a key component for success with your offering um, is the data and the analytics element. So can you, you know, if, if that's correct, can you comment on that and why that data element is so important? Maybe Rachel, would you like to, to comment on that first? Yeah, so part of when we were doing exploration of our product, um, just sticking sensors in there uh, showed us so much data and so many patterns in the data that suggest that like there are different ways we can diagnose. There's different you know indicators to suggest certain things, and obviously these things need to be clinically um, valid and proven out, but just that application of sensors of those those objective data elements was so critical for us. Uh, and when we pair that with um, the subjective data, so understanding that a lot of women, there is this mental health and stress component to, to pelvic health. Um, you know, there's an overall physical body side of things. We like to separate pelvic health into five different categories, looking at tissues, organs, incontinence, all these different things. Uh, when you pair all of that together, and we push that to clinician, what we wanted to do was show the clinician, okay, age ranges, you know, cultural backgrounds, different diagnoses, or maybe the same diagnoses, what are some of the patterns we're starting to see in these data trends, whether it's objective, objective, or a pair of both of those things. And we could start to predict and actually start to move towards proactive management versus this reactive management that we do uh, with a lot of, of medicine, not just pelvic health. And so that's why data became so important for us is to, to learn about these things and to start to pair these things in um, to make better healthcare decisions, Great. especially on pelvic. Thank you. And A. Yeah, if I may, you know, again, like, the current sizing of pestry is perfectly circular, mostly rigid, sometimes very large to support the prolapse. And so, you know, we see from the ultrasound images, like um, our vaginas have angles. So we're making, you know, angular pestries as opposed to just one size fits all. And so those, um, accuracy, we, we see it with better resolutions under ultrasound. And, um, and I think, you know, compared to today's finger measurements, oh, we think your, your vagina is this long, this wide, you know, that's, this is where the accuracy and resolution are going to help women a lot with COSM's that gynothotics technology. Right. And oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to stop you. No, go ahead. Just to add to that, you know, um, it's we've we've just finished our clinical study in the GTA area. Um, eight women successfully wear our gynothotics and they found improved um, satisfaction over their off the shelf pestries because we can do this kind of customization. Oh, excellent. That's fantastic. So then looking ahead to 2022 and beyond, um, can you share what new things you're looking to accomplish um, that will even have greater impact on, on, on improving women's pelvic floor health? And also um, 
to what extent will your products be available in 2022? Maybe a would you like to comment sure. on that? We're actually right now closing a C round. Um, Derek is um, very busy and very successfully doing that. Um, and so with that, once that C round is closed, we're going to be staffing up as well. You know, COVID had a big dent on our company's progress over the last two years. We are looking to move forward and make, um, you know, really speedy progress with um, with our new um, or with our seed round closing. So um, we have quite a few clinical studies upcoming. Um, we hired a full-time quality engineer, as you know, MD SAP and ISO certifications are are very key to um, getting um, our companies into positioning so that we can start filing for regulatory approval, which we hope to do at the end of 2022. So um, we hope to get approval and launch in 2023. Fantastic. Congrats. And Rachel? Yeah, so we are, uh, we're currently working on V1 of the, the device. So it's called Flora. Um, that will be going into two clinical trials, one uh, on endometriosis patients at McMaster University under Dr. Leonardi, and the second is with Grand River Cancer Center on radiation-induced vaginal stenosis for uh, cancer patients. So if anyone listening is in either of those areas you can uh, and work with those clinics, you can apply to, to be a part of it. Our goal is to also go out for our Health Canada and uh, FDA approvals. And our goal is hopefully 2023 launch of the, the products. We also have a couple more products in R&D. So we're working on a colorectal device, uh, you know, conducting similar therapies, as well as an external pad that'll be used uh, for women um, externally in that area. And yeah, I think that's, okay. that's pretty much it. Oh, that's super. So just maybe one minute or less each, um, because we're coming down to, to the end of the half hour, but um, why or how did partnering with U of W make a difference? And you could you also just tell us your connection to U of W past or present? Maybe A, over to you first. Sure. I graduated from system design engineering um, from Waterloo. So Waterloo will always have a place in my heart. And so I was very thrilled. We have affiliation with the, the additive manufacturing group at U of Waterloo. Um, we have a couple of research projects on the go with Waterloo as well. Um, Great. And not just Waterloo, but other universities in Ontario, of course. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, A. And Rachel? Uh, MBET, uh, Masters of Business Entrepreneurship and Technology is what I did. Uh, that was... 2013, 14, I don't even know anymore. Um, I graduated that. Uh, most of my uh, employees are from the University of Waterloo. I hire out of the co-op program regularly, part of Getty, and I'm part of Velocity as well. Oh, that's great. Fantastic. Well, thank you, you know, so much. And I'm sorry to interrupt this great conversation, but we, we do have to wrap up the half hour um, because we're, we're nearly out of time before we'll move on to the Q&A. So I really want to thank you both so much, A and, and Rachel, for your thoughts and, and for actually shining a light on this subject that, um, you know, I, I have to say, I didn't know anything about this before meeting you both and learning about what you're doing and your companies. And then even having this conversation today, I learned a lot and I, I really hope the audience has as well. And I hope that will shine a light and just spread some knowledge on this topic. Um, so um, this topic of how breakthroughs in technology are making a difference for women's pelvic floor disorders. Um, so I'm hoping the audience can stay on now for an optional 10 minutes of Q&A. But if you need to drop off, I want to thank you for joining us. Um, and if you want to exchange some thoughts with Cosm Medical or Hi Ivy, just please let me know. We don't share your contact information outside of the university. We only make introductions at your request. And please feel free to reach out to me, Bridget Maloney. Um, my email address is on the screen here or on the homepage of JEDI. 
And so we're, we actually are gonna be taking a break from the monthly webinars for a little while. But in the meantime, I invite you to follow Jedi on LinkedIn and Twitter or sign up for the Jedi newsletter, monthly newsletter and to be informed of news and events. And you can find all those links on our homepage and at the social handles on the slide. So hopefully um, some of you, uh, most of you are able to stay on for a few more minutes of Q and A. And um, so I'm happy to, to start that Q&A and really want to thank those in the audience who submitted questions um, during beforehand during the registration system, as well as uh, live during this webinar. So I've been provided with a selection of those questions to ask A and Rachel. And, and of course, you're both welcome to contribute to the discussion of each, but maybe we'll try and keep the answers somewhat short so we can allow for a maximum number of questions. So the first question came to us from the webinar registration system. It's, it's a long one, which uh, I've pared down somewhat. Um, and maybe first I'll go to you, A. Uh, so the question is, are there joint opportunities for your company to leverage other Canadian scale up and startup solutions and services as building blocks to accelerate innovation and drive growth for your company? Yes, absolutely. Um, that's exactly what we're doing. And I think Government of Canada, through programs like IRAP um, and GEN, are uh, accelerating that for startups. Um, where we recently finished a project with um, a 3D printing company, Matterfold, uh, making use of their software to make lattice structures. So um, Great. that's an example, and we, we have definitely other collaborations in the works um, supported by both at the provincial and federal government levels. Fantastic. Rachel, is there anything you'd like to comment on for High Ivy? Yeah, I mean, collaborations are super important. We are collaborating on a clinical trial with a big competitor against Peloton. Um, so we're, we're constantly looking for partnerships. I think that's part of innovation is making these partnerships. Manufacturing is a big one, like A said. And um, I mean, the government really helps with this. I think what I would love to see more is more collaborations with the healthcare system specifically, especially since... In Canada, unfortunately, we're so lacking the adoption of innovation. Um, you know, we can get to a point where we test these things out in a healthcare environment, but that procurement side is really what's lacking. Uh, I know they're starting to make changes in it, but it's really something that's lacking to prevent us all from just going south of the border and selling our products there. Um, I'd love to see more, more innovation adoption from the healthcare um, setting side. Okay, thank you. And actually the next question that came in is, uh, I'll start with you, Rachel, because it it segues from somewhat from what you just said. Um, so the question is, Hi Ivy and Cosm Medical are both solution-based companies, but solutions work best when people can afford specialized devices or services. Even though Canada is known for universal health care, will most Canadians' provincial health care systems cover the type of care you are providing? Or would people have to rely on workplace health insurance benefits for those fortunate enough to have that. And some Rachel, if you'd like to comment on that and then over to you, A. Yeah, it, it's a great question. And I think part of what we're trying to understand is how do we make these things more accessible? Um, there's obviously that huge, when you, you adopt innovation, there's obviously a cost that comes with that. Uh, and so part of what we're looking at and why I know we went medical first was because that reimbursement pathway and having insurance coverage is so important. So, you know, there are steps that we do have to take and it does take time to get things like CPT codes for that coverage to be able to afford the devices. But, um, you know, that's the reason why we're going medical first and, and yeah. Great, thanks. On the OHIP side, the ultrasound is covered by OHIP, so is the S3. Um, but at a lower um, amount on the pestry side. Um, but we know through, yes, private health insurance, through physiotherapy, it's covered at a higher amount. Like I think there's something $70 through OHIP versus $450 through the physiotherapist. So we do um, plan to do clinical studies 
to get addition, you know, the CPT code as a system for our device. And that's part of our strategy. And what is CTT code? It's the US, um, US reimbursement um, and insurance codes. Uh, okay, thank you. I wasn't familiar with that term. Um, okay, thanks. So next question. Um, do you have advice on, or I, I guess even more broadly, are there physical therapy exercises that can be done to improve pelvic floor? And, and based on what you're saying, A, it sounds like, yes, there are physical therapies that can be done, but is that too broad of a question or would you like to comment on that aspect? Maybe A first. Um, I know, I mean, there are devices and there is um, innovation with apps as well um, that are happening recently. Um, Rachel, I don't know, I don't, I don't know the names off the top of my head. Over to you, Rachel. Okay, yes. Um, so I would say, please, please, please do not do any physical therapy exercises without seeing a pelvic floor physiotherapist first. So they are an out of pocket, you can get coverage through insurance. Um, but depending, I don't know what your situations are, I would get advice on what is the static status of your pelvic floor. Um, obviously, you know, you can Google physical therapy exercises and it'll usually send you to Kegels, but I am always like red flag, red flag, please don't do it. See what your issues are first, whether it's prolapse, whether it's tight pelvic floor, whether it's, you know, any of these things to understand what exercises you should be doing. Um, because often Kegels can actually make you worse off than better off. So I want to just raise that, that understand this, the, the status of your pelvic floor first, whether it's hypo and hyper, and then that can lead you to the exercises. Right. Okay. Thank you. So next question, uh, it's not actually a question, but um, someone in the audience wrote in to say, this isn't a question, but I just wanted to take the time to thank Jedi and University of Waterloo for taking the opportunity to profile such an important topic. The work that caused them medical and high IV is doing will truly make a big difference in the lives of so many women. By boldly presenting this topic, advances will be made in helping to reduce the stigma associated with a very basic women's health issue. So thank you. And I'd like to add to that, that um, not only thank you, but I, I find it fascinating to hear um, that how technology and material science and additive manufacturing and AI data analytics. I mean, it, it's, there are so many technologies um, that are applied to both of your solutions. And so it's, it's been really fascinating for me as well. Thank you. And for the audience, I'm sure. Um, another question, let me see. Um, there's a lot of hope here to revolutionize the existing devices and rehabilitation systems, which haven't changed for so long. And actually, I believe it's decades and decades. Is that right? Up until recently. Both High Ivy and COSM have been working hard trying to improve the standard of care. And since they are so standard, has it been difficult trying to change the standard? And how receptive has the medical community so far been in accepting the need for change? Um, Rachel, perhaps over to you. And then, um, and then A for a, a quick comment as well. And then uh, we'll unfortunately have to wrap up. Yeah. So, um... Definitely shocking and eye-opening for the, the healthcare system. I will share, you know, there are challenges in adoption, especially when things have been done for so long in a certain way. Um, but when <laughs> I will share that uh, my oncologist is actually running our one clinical trial, when I brought this forward, that their standard of care that they were giving out for free at the cancer center, which is down the road from a lot of <laughs> University of Waterloo people, um, they were like, why are we doing this? This makes zero sense. The research does not like it's very lacking and women are not doing anything that we're telling them to do. Like we need to change this. And so just bringing forward this problem area was a huge eye opener for a lot of people that we're working with. So we're seeing the hesitancy on that old school way of doing things, but um, that willingness to be open to adopting new things. On our, on the side of the pestry, yes, like even two years ago when I 
first during COSM and we're setting up these clinical studies and looking at predicates, there was only been one other paper written on a custom pestry for one woman. And so, you know, it's really the lack of innovation actually motivates us. And um, I think since then, more and more a couple of other companies have been in this field, one from Europe, another one from Canada. So, you know, um, I think that it's driving innovation for the better. Um, yeah. Great. Well, I want to thank the audience very much for joining this Q&A, but a big thank you to our guests, A. San from Cosm Medical and Rachel Bartholomew, Bartholomew excuse me, from High Ivy. Um, your insights and experience are, are very much appreciated. So if anyone in the audience would like to exchange some thoughts with Cosm Medical or High Ivy on, you know, um, the technology and technological advances around products and, and services for women's pelvic floor health, please let me know. As I said earlier, your contact information is not shared outside the university and we'll make introductions only at your request. And if you heard something today that intrigued you and you want to explore further with either company um, or about JEDI or the JEDI Exchange, I invite you to reach out to me and we'll connect you with each company. So as I mentioned earlier, there's no planned webinar for the next little while, but we invite you to follow JEDI on LinkedIn and Twitter and sign up for the monthly newsletter to be informed of news and events. And you can see the social handles there on the slide. So this ends our session for today and a big thank you to our guests and the audience and uh, have a great day. Thank you.